Good morning. Ithoma rito rio muthi ya kwabiriria ri kuma buku ine ya Corini tho. Muhari wa 10, muhari wa 16 na 17. Atere gikombe kiria turathimaga na kiria turathimaga kai atarikio uhoro wa kugwatanira thakame ya Kristo na riri mugate uri atunyu twenyurangaga kai atari uhoro wa kugwatanira mwiri wa Kristo idwe na idwe ona tugitwe katuli andu aingi turi mugate umwe na mwiri umwe ni undu idwe othe turiaga mugate o umwe Yohanes 6 ayat 1 sampai 14 Yesus memberi makan 5000 orang. Sesudah itu Yesus berangkat ke seberang Danau Galilea yaitu Danau Tiberias. Orang banyak berbondong-bondong mengikuti dia karena mereka melihat mukjizat-mukjizat penyembuhan yang diadakannya terhadap orang-orang sakit. Dan Yesus naik ke atas gunung dan duduk di situ dengan murid-muridnya. Dan pasca hari raya orang Yahudi sudah dekat. Ketika Yesus memandang sekelilingnya dan melihat bahwa orang banyak berbondong-bondong kepadanya datang, berkata ia kepada Filipus, "Di manakah kita akan memberi roti supaya mereka ini dapat makan?" Hal itu dikatakannya untuk mencobai dia, sebab ia sendiri yang tahu apa yang hendak dilakukannya. Jawab Filipus kepadanya, "Roti seharga 200 dinar tidak akan cukup untuk mereka ini, sekalipun masing-masing mendapat sepotong kecil saja." Seorang dari murid-muridnya yaitu Andreas, saudara Simon Petrus berkata kepadanya, "Di sini ada orang, seorang anak yang mempunyai lima roti jelai dan dua ikan. Tetapi apakah artinya itu untuk orang sebanyak ini?" kata Yesus. "Suruhlah orang-orang itu duduk. Adapun di tempat itu banyak rumput. Maka duduklah orang-orang itu kira-kira lima ribu laki-laki banyaknya." Lalu Yesus mengambil roti itu, mengucap syukur dan membagi-bagikannya kepada mereka yang duduk di situ. Demikian juga dibuatnya dengan ikan-ikan itu, sebanyak mereka yang kendaki. Dan setelah mereka kenyang, ia berkata kepada murid-muridnya, kumpulkanlah potongan-potongan yang lebih, supaya tidak ada yang terbuang. Maka mereka pun mengumpulkannya, dan mengisi dua belas bakul penuh dengan potongan-potongan, dari kelima roti jelai, yang lebih setelah orang makan. Ketika orang-orang itu melihat mujizat yang telah diadakannya, mereka berkata, dia ini adalah benar-benar Nabi yang akan datang ke dalam dunia. The church in Korea has a way of praying, and I can't think of what the name of it is, and I tried to look it up and I couldn't find it. But everyone prays out loud at the same time. We've tried that a few times at annual conference, and the sound is sort of staggering because so many people are speaking at one time. The reason that they do that is to affirm their belief that no matter how many people pray at one time, God hears each voice, God hears each petition, God knows what each person needs and what the thoughts of their hearts would be. And so this morning we thought it was great to listen to the word of God proclaimed. Could you hear that Yesu that came out through the different versions? You knew when we were talking about Jesus. I remember being in Japan and visiting a Christian church in Japan. And Christians make up less than 2% of the population of Japan. And a man sang, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I recognized the tune and I recognized the song without knowing necessarily what the words were. Well, we have a story about a crowd today, and I hope you read. And if you didn't read, you probably know the story of Jesus and the feeding of the multitudes. It is the only miracle story that appears in all four Gospels, the only one. But there are some very significant differences, and I hope you paid attention and read, and I hope that you think through what these differences are. For John, John is the only one where Jesus does the feeding himself. 
In the others, Jesus has the disciples pass out the loaves and the fish. And in this, we hear that it is the gift of a small child who has really just enough for his lunch. Because if we're talking about the Sea of Tiberias or the Sea of Galilee, which is really Lake Genesaret, it is the freshwater lake that surprised the drinking water for all of Jerusalem. It's not all that big. It's not really a sea. It's an inland lake. And the fish that swim there, the fish that most of the disciples would have been catching, are what we would call sardines. So we're talking about little fish. And we're talking about loaves of bread, not like the very generous loaves up here. We're talking little pita-like loaves. It's also the story that mentions that Jesus does this at the Passover. Now, he asks them, where are we going to buy food for this crowd? The problem with that is that was an impossible situation. There was not a Walmart on the Sea of Galilee. And even if there had been, what kind of store would have enough for 5,000 men? 5,000 men, not counting the women and children with them. So the crowd was probably closer to 10,000 people. And if they weren't all praying at one time, I'm sure their stomachs were growling at one time because they had gone out to see this man. These were not all devout Jews who had come to see him. There were people who had heard rumors about him. There were people who had heard about him that he could feed people who were hungry, that he could heal people who were sick. They wanted to see just what he was because he was sort of a spectacle something that they had heard about and needed to see for themselves, and so they gathered, some in faith, some in doubt, some in just wanting to know what was going on. And I'm sure they were talking as he was trying to teach. I'm sure that they weren't paying attention fully to what was going on because there was no public address system. And yet, when it comes time for evening, Jesus turns to the disciples and says to them, where are we going to buy bread? Someone at least had the sense to say, well, we do have this little bit of food. But then the question that comes after, but what is this among so many? I think that's probably my favorite part of the story. What is this among so many? Well, if it's left as it is, it's not much. But if it is given in faith to God through Jesus Christ, amazing incredible things can happen. Here's another thing we should say that's a difference with John. John doesn't talk about miracles. What does John talk about? Let's, let's test your biblical knowledge on this one. John doesn't say miracle. John says this is what? This is a sign. This is a sign. And what does a sign do? It points to a reality. It tells you what's ahead. It tells you what's coming. This is a sign of who God is. And can you imagine, probably a few of you can, possibly because you came from a place where food was scarce, possibly because you lived through the Depression, but we cannot, most of us, imagine what it would be like to be people who never had enough to eat, who end up with leftovers. How many of you ever have leftovers at your house? How many of you grew up with brothers and there was nothing left over, ever? <laughs> My husband was 6'4 and a half and weighed 260 pounds that he could eat. But when his son and his former stepson came to dinner, I was amazed. I felt like the wife and seven brides for seven brothers when they all sat down and had to explain to these boys that once broccoli is cooked, it is no longer considered a finger food. <laughs> and when one of them said to me, we need milk, I said, I just opened a gallon. Yes, but that was before breakfast. We're talking people who never had enough to eat. And there are leftovers. People who didn't even probably have a word for leftovers. And that is a sign of who God is and who God will be in Jesus Christ. There's also another very important difference in this story. This is the Passover. And as I said, this is the only miracle story or sign story that appears in all four Gospels. But you know what does not appear in all four Gospels? The story of the Last Supper being the beginning of the Eucharist, or what we call Holy Communion. Because if you'll remember in John's Gospel, when you get to chapter 13, Jesus does not say, this is my body, this is my blood. What does Jesus do? He takes off his robe, and he kneels, and he washes their feet, which becomes a symbol for Bill's order of deacon, a servant minister. 
the basin, and the towel. So many biblical scholars believe that for John, the feeding of the multitudes is the Eucharist. It is the Holy Communion. It is Passover. And they say, this is surely a prophet who has come into the world. Because they've seen some of these things happen before with the prophet Elisha when they had not enough food nearly to serve the people who were there. And he turned it to God, and God blessed it, and the same thing happened. They would have remembered Moses at the Passover, Moses leading the people to freedom through the sea. And Jesus is leading them to a new kind of freedom. I knew that I was called to the ministry when I took part in Holy Communion as a small child. I knew then that that is what I was supposed to do because I was always amazed at how God could take ordinary things and make them into something extraordinary that would feed people. Not just feed people in their bellies, but to feed people in their hearts and in their souls, to feed them in their lives before God in a way that unites us to each other and unites us to Christ. Holy Communion has something in common with Passover as well. When Jews sit down at the Seder meal to celebrate the Passover, they are sitting down at the table in Israel. They are sitting there, and there is actually a seat that's left open for Elijah to come. But they sit there, and they remember the story, and they say, how is this night different from all other nights? And they recount God's mighty deeds in bringing Israel to freedom. Just as that happens, we sit with Jesus at the Last Supper when we come to this table. But we're not just in the past. This is not remembrance. This is, in fact, a sign. We are here with each other, and that is beautiful and precious. We are here sharing, and this day that we call World Communion Sunday, we're aware of the people who are sharing communion on all parts of the globe, sharing with us the body and the blood of Christ, separated by the kind of bread we eat, separated by language, separated by culture, separated by time zones, but joined together in Jesus Christ in such a powerful way. Now, when I went through my ordination examination, back in those days, you pulled a question out of an envelope and you had seven minutes to answer it. My question was, explain the words of Christ in the Eucharistic prayer, this is my body, this is my blood. Explain if communion is really an activity between the communicant and God or the communicant and the community of faith, and please address the eschatology of Holy Communion. And I thought, oh no. But it's the eschatology of Holy Communion that grabs me every time. What that means is the fact that we're not just in the past with Christ and the disciples gathered at that table. We're not just here with each other. We are at the table in the kingdom of heaven, where those who have gone before have already gathered. This is a meal that joins time and space and place and heart and person. We are all one loaf together. We are all one body before Christ. Now, Mike always asks me, what do you have in mind for the sermon when he does the PowerPoint slide? And what do you have in mind when you're talking about crowdsourcing? Have you all heard about crowdsourcing? That's one of those, one of those words that has turned up. And actually, it's been around for a while. I, I looked up the origin of it. It was in 2006. Crowdsourcing is a way to go into the community, into the crowd, to either get information, sometimes funding, sometimes to have work done that otherwise would have been done by a small group of people. It's a strange thing, and it's used a lot in business. Now, have you ever seen the Lay's potato chip when you get to suggest a flavor to them? And that's why they end up with things like Reuben sandwich, Lay's potato chips. That's crowdsourcing. GoFundMe is crowdsourcing. You ever have someone say, I'm collecting money on Facebook, perhaps even. For my birthday this year, I want you to make a donation to that. That's crowdsourcing. But I think that there are other images of crowdsourcing. A few weeks ago, this is the story we told when we met with the little kids before vacation Bible, not vacation Bible school, before Sunday school started a few weeks back. We made soup downstairs on our mission Sunday. You're familiar with the story of stone soup? 
at a time of famine, a man comes to the town and he knocks on doors and he says, could you share a little bit of food with me because I don't have anything to eat? And someone said, I only have one potato, I can't share, and closes the door. Someone else says, I only have a cup of beans, it's not enough for my family, I can't share. And so he goes into the middle of town and he borrows a pot from someone and he fills it with water and he takes a stone out of his pocket and he puts the stone into the water and he starts to stir it. He goes, oh, that smells so good. And people come out to see what's happening. And they said, what are you doing? And he said, oh, I'm making stone soup. I have this magic soup and it makes such beautiful soup. And they're saying, what are you talking about? That's a pot with water and a rock. And he said, oh no, it's gonna be so good. If only I had a potato, that would make it great. And the person says, well, I have a potato and adds it to the pot. Someone else says, I have a carrot and adds it to the pot. He said, onion would be fabulous. And someone says, I have one onion and they add it to the pot. That's crowdsourcing. And because they do that, do they have magical stone soup? No. They have vegetable soup because they have decided to let go of what they were holding on to. And once it's shared, it becomes something that is blessed and that is expanded and that feeds a multitude. We don't know if that poor kid in the story was coaxed out of his lunch or he just offered it up to Jesus. But when he did, it was blessed in a way that is a sign of who God is for us. It was blessed and it was expanded. Jesus, who in John's Gospel turned water into wine, can turn one kid's lunch into a feast for 10,000 with leftovers. And then God can take that wine, or in our case, grape juice, and turn it into the lifeblood of our Savior. This is a holy thing that we're doing this morning. Because when we do this, what we're saying is that we are willing to enter into the new life that Christ offers us, and that we are willing to enter into the human family, and that we are willing to do what he says, which is to offer up all that we have and all that we are, to trust what we can become in God's hands. I know churches are getting smaller, and. I hate that we talk in numbers, but look at what Jesus did with 12 ordinary human beings. Look what he did with a little bit of fish and a little bit of bread. And imagine what he could do if Christians all over the world said, here am I, here is what I have. Take it, bless it, and use it. That's crowdsourcing that we need for this world that we live in. So when you come forward this morning, I'm gonna ask you to do things maybe in a way that you haven't done them before. Because I always try to tell people this is a celebration. And you don't take communion. You receive communion because it's a gift. So come forward with your hands open and your hearts open to receive what God will give you in gratitude in humility, and then go into the world with your hands and your heart open to others, because Christ needs you to share all that you have and all that you are, so that others may see the sign and follow to the glory of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.